I'm going to introduce you to someone who's been working in this area for a long time, who's very well known, I'm sure doesn't really need any introduction, but Professor Stephen Blair is now a Professor of Exercise Science and Epidemiology at the University of South Carolina. He's been heavily involved in ACSM and has honors from everywhere, including the US Surgeon General. And it's my absolute pleasure, before I introduce Steve, though I'm going to say thank you, because I forgot to our sponsors for this session who are also in the audience. Thank you very much to Coca-Cola for your generous sponsorship. And then I'll come back to Steve and say, please welcome Steve Blair all the way from South Carolina. Thank you very much, Wendy. It certainly is a pleasure to be here. Love coming to Australia, and we are going to talk about uh, energy balance today. And until we better understand energy balance, as the title of, of this presentation indicates, there's no way in the world we can deal effectively with the obesity epidemic. So here are my uh, disclosures, and the major study that I'll be talking about uh, a little bit I'm giving a mostly background, I'll talk a little bit about our energy balance study, and then Greg Hand will talk more. And we are grateful to Coca-Cola for the funding of the energy balance study. So we have an obesity epidemic. I don't think you have to be a complete fool to deny that. All, all around the world, we have an obesity epidemic. And that results from too many people being in a positive caloric balance on too many days. I mean, that's kind of the simplistic uh, of view. But there's so much confusion, in fact, downright stupidity about uh, this issue that I just get more and more angry. And uh, when I drop dead of a heart attack uh, giving one of these talks, my wife has instructions to sue the obesity cartel who keep uh, bringing up some of these things. So here's just an example. Uh, I love Google. I can do research on an airplane. They have Wi-Fi. So I type in a few months ago, inactivity, physical uh, inactivity. Sedentary behavior, eating too much, obesity, diet and obesity, inactivity and obesity, physical inactivity and obesity. Uh, Liz Joy led an effort to uh, uh, write an article for the British Journal of Sports Medicine to encourage uh, more physicians to bring physical activity counseling uh, in, into their practice. And in the introduction, I, I, we, I had just done this, and I said, well, let's, let's say, you know, there's a 30-fold difference in Google for the hits for obesity and inactivity, 30-fold. So we got the reviews back, and one reviewer said, well, what's that? That's just Google. That doesn't mean anything. What about PubMed? So Liz checked PubMed. 40-fold difference. This is crazy. We have an obesity epidemic. We need to know more about energy balance. We have 30, 40 fold difference on one side of the equation. Do we have an epidemic? You know, one third, and I just read in the paper in Tasmania last week, a third of Australians, maybe it's Tasmanians, are obese, and a third are overweight. Oh my God, two thirds of the population are overweight or obese. Now, if we use the correct cut point, for overweight, lower it down to 22, then I don't know what the rates are, but my God, they'd really be high. Might be 80%. So then we'd have an even bigger problem to carry on about. However, what the people who like to promote this uh, fail to understand is that overweight is good for you. It is good for you. Here from our National Health and Nutrition Examination, survey, the reference category is normal uh, weight. So yeah, it's bad to be skinny. I've been working really hard to avoid that one. <laughs> I think I'm safe. But in the U.S., 86,000 fewer deaths a year in the overweight category. 86,000 fewer. If you get into class one obesity, okay, there are more. It's not actually significant. You get up into class two obesity, okay, then these two pretty much match. And there was a very nice meta-analysis just a few weeks ago in JAMA by Mercedes Carthenon. I'm not going to take the time to show that. But again, it shows that <coughs> overweight is good for you. You have lower risk. And those are, I think, patients with type 2 diabetes. 
And we continue to see statements such as this from many investigators. Oh, it's all energy intake, people eating too much, cheap food, fast food, eating out, portion size. That explains the increase in weight because physical activity hasn't changed. Well, what, I, I'm a little surprised that some of the, you know, these are full professors and scientists and good recommendations, uh, don't really understand, but I'll come back to energy expenditure in a moment. Okay, here's a pop test, which U.S. professors like to give. Uh, this uh, uh, McDonald's, look at that. Fries and McNuggets and Big Macs and Coke, uh, sugary drinks, look at that. What an awful meal for a family of four. When they could, at half the price, have you know, baked chicken and some salad and baked potatoes and some whole grain bread, etc. Big difference in cost. Which one of those two meals has fewer calories per person and fewer grams of fat? Now, some of you are already suspicious of me, so you probably would guess what, go against your intuition. But uh, here are the calories in the McDonald's per person, 937 grams of fat. Here it is for the home cooked meal. More calories and slightly more fat. Aren't you a little surprised by that? Given all the, the messages that have bombarded you about how awful fast food is? Well, actually, <laughs> look at the number, look at the data. Don't just believe the blogosphere and the people who carry on about this. Now I say, okay, have, uh, are Americans eating more than they did? Well, this report came out in 2004 called Trends in Energy Intake. So the first two of the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys, data here for the men, exactly the same intake, and for the last two, pretty much the same. And when this report came out, I happened to have a distinguished visitor of visiting, visiting us in Dallas, Rear Admiral Dr. Van Hubbard. Now some of you say, well, who in the world is that? Well, he happens to be the director of the National Institutes of Health Nutrition Office, and he's sitting right here, and if I say something really stupid, he'll jump up and shout me down. But he said, you can't call these trends. Why not? I need to go back. The reason you can't, how do I go back? that way? Yeah. Uh, is because the methods between these two surveys and those two surveys changed enormously. These surveys were Monday through Friday. These were Monday through Sunday. And the interviewers at this point were trained to do much more intensive probing in the 24-hour recalls. The more you probe asking someone what they ate yesterday, the more calories you find. So Van said, he taught me this, you can't call this a trend, it's a change in methods. And then what people overlook is that we need to take into account the change in weight, you know, 10, 12 kilograms over this period of time, these people burn more calories than the rest of the metabolic rate. We actually ought to be eating more just to stay alive. But let's come to uh, activity. People say, well, physical activity hasn't changed. Well, I want to have people in this audience probably don't need this instruction, but self-reported leisure time physical activity, do you walk, run, jog, play, tennis, swim, etc. that is not a measure of total energy expenditure. And Greg will talk a good bit more about that in just a few minutes. So here's a report Tim Church published um, a little over a year ago. You don't have to be an expert in labor statistics. We took uh, data from the U.S. Department of Labor over the last 50 years. All of you could have drawn this slide. And you, you're not experts. What's gone down? Agriculture. Damn right, I got out of that stuff in 1962. Uh, and also mining, manufacturing, etc. Service jobs have gone up. There's a difference in energy expenditure. I can still do hard work. I was visiting Il Kavori in Finland uh, uh, some time back, and he knows I like to go to salmon. He said, Steve, uh, you know, we need some wood for sauna. Why don't you saw and chop some wood for the sauna so we'd be ready for nice sound. So I did. I'm working hard. And then I finished that. I said, well, I wonder what Yoka has in mind for me next. Now, this is goods producing work here. And this is supervisory work. <laughs> the energy expenditure is a lot lower than supervisory work. 
So uh, Diana Thomas modeled these data for us. Uh, here's what she came up with, uh, 140 calories, fewer calories a day in men, 120 in women, in occupational energy expenditure. This is more than enough to explain the obesity epidemic. And in fact, the R squared between her estimates of energy expenditure on the job and changes in weight correlated 0.92 with the NHANES measured weights. I defy the people who think it's all due to eating too much to show me data with an R squared of 0.92. And then we have this paper now in review, uh, trends in household energy expense. You have to be a complete moron to say, well, this trend, maybe the exact numbers are not right, but can you doubt that from 1965 to today, I don't think we had self-propelled vacuum cleaners. I don't think we had uh, microwave ovens. Look at this, down with what? Uh, nearly 1,800 calories a week for women. However, guys, men are actually doing more. How about that? But no, my point is, total energy expenditure needs to be considered, not self-reported leisure time activity with lousy questionnaires. So this led us to the need for an energy balance uh, study. And again, I'm grateful to Coca-Cola for funding this. Uh, we're trying to measure intake and expenditure in a larger group of people, free living group of people, and a better than it uh, typically has been done. So we're measuring expenditure uh, with the armband, uh, which again correlates very well with uh, uh, doubly labeled water measures. Now granted, if you lock somebody up in a chamber, you'd get better data on energy balance, but free living, wear this for two weeks, we ask them to wear it 24 hours a day, except when showering, bathing, swimming, and during that same period of time, we get three random 24-hour dietary recalls done by a top-notch center that has done hundreds of thousands of these, they know how to do them. I mean, it's still self-reported uh, diet, but I think these are as good a data as you can get in a large free living uh, group. Other measures, we're not relying on height and weight, body composition, we're measuring resting metabolic rate after 12 hour fast, 30 minutes resting in a quiet room, then measuring the gas exchange, uh, fitness, blood chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And at one year, uh, we're getting doubly labeled water measures in 200 of these individuals. All of these measures, except the doubly labeled water, every three months, for two years. So we're going to be able to track intake and expenditure, body composition and weight, and we're going to get some better data on this energy balance weight issue. And, you know, I'm a scientist. Maybe it'll show that I've been wrong all these years. I am 73, I can retire, I'm okay to heck with it, I quit. I was wrong. Now let's wait and see. Uh, we have 430 young adults, men and women equally divided, and, and two different age groups recruited into this study. Uh, we just started last month the uh, um, one year follow up. So we got nearly everyone through the three month, a lot of people through six months. So the <clears throat> data are building. What we're able to show at this meeting are uh, the baseline data. The baseline data are clean and ready for presentation. And so I do thank uh, the co-PIs, uh, Greg Hand, you'll hear from in a minute, James A. Bear, and then this brilliant staff of people, two of whom are here. Anyway, uh, Robin Chuck and Amanda Palooch, you also have papers at this meeting. So thank you very, very much for your attention, and I love to argue. Thank you, Steve. We have time for a burning question or an issue of clarification, if there is one. Other more complicated questions, please hold them till later. But if there's a, a question about the methods or something that Steve said at this stage, but can't wait. I think you're off the hook, Steve. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now, the next speaker is Dr. Gregory Han, who is Professor of Exercise Science and Director of the Clinical Exercise Research Center at the Arnold School of Public Health in the University of South Carolina. Greg's work has been broadly in the area of physiological and psychological adjustments to acute activity and chronic effects of exercise training. Welcome. Following Steve Blair is difficult, but I will, uh, I will give it my best shot. Point it up a little bit. Okay. 
And as Steve pointed out, we have a big study going on. It's a two-year study. We've gotten through the baseline work. We're actually looking at 630 variables and 430 people quarterly for two years. So this is a this is a massive undertaking. And today I wanted to show you some of the data that we're getting <coughs> from the baseline, from the 430 that have come from the baseline. This related to weight and body composition. When we talk about energy balance, most people think of a scale that has intake on one side and expenditure on the other, and whichever way the scale is swinging, weight will increase or decrease. This is the way I think about energy balance, because it's extremely complicated, and that's to some degree a cop-out, but in fact it's true. If you look at this model, simply what you put in your mouth doesn't necessarily mean that your body's going to absorb it. At, depending on what's in the food, what kind of fibers in the food, the biotics in the gut can, can change or reduce or increase the amount of energy that's actually absorbed into the body. Of that energy, it goes through numerous pathways that can use the energy. Thermic effect of food, about 10% of the total daily energy intake. Resting metabolic rate, about 60% of the total daily energy expenditure. Physical activity energy expenditure and something that people are looking at more recently is spontaneous activity energy expenditure. The fidgeting that goes on in the room that I'm looking at right now is an example of spontaneous activity. The energy that isn't burned, of course, is going to go into storage. And storage is not a simple concept itself. You have body compartmentalization of the storage, tissue type. Someone who's doing a lot of resistance training is going to gain muscle mass. That is energy storage just as well as fat. For someone who isn't doing any kind of training, most of the energy will be stored as fat. Energy mobilization. If your energy expenditure is greater than your energy intake, you're going to have your liver dumping sugar and your adipose tip tissue dumping lipids into the bloodstream. What isn't used is going to be reabsorbed into tissues and stored, and perhaps in other places, depending on the hormonal milieu of the individual at the time. And lastly, energy conversion, which is a big topic. Can we as humans actually convert sugar to fat? We know that rodents can do it. Humans don't seem to have the capacity to do it that rodents do. We have to, we have to consume massive quantities of sugar to be able to, con to convert it to fat. So energy balance model itself is very complex. When you add on top of that, the confusion of body weight, body mass, and body composition it's amazing that the lay public can understand anything that happens related to weight gain, weight loss, and trying to manage your weight. The data that I'm showing is data from the energy balance study, and as you can see, if you look at weight of the individuals, and these are just the women, there were about 250 women in the group, as the weight increases, total daily energy expenditure increases. That's not news. Moving mass takes energy, and the more mass, the more energy it takes. So it's not really news to us that the larger the person, the heavier the person, the more, ma the more energy they're going to expend moving around during the day. But for the lay public, they simply think that if you're fat, you burn fewer calories than people who aren't fat. And it's simply not the case. As I said, about 60% of total daily energy expenditure is resting metabolic rate. If you look at weight quantiles, so these are the lightest, these are the heaviest individuals, what you see is their absolute resting metabolic rate in liters per minute, goes up at an R of about 0.767. Heavier people are burning more energy overall, and heavier people have a higher rest of metabolic rate in absolute terms. If you look at total daily energy expenditure in terms of body fat percent in the women, you see something very different. What you see is that there's really almost no correlation at all. There's no, no, certainly nothing significant between body fat percent and total daily energy expenditure. In fact, what I found interesting was if you look at these, these green circles at the bottom, they're circling the five women who have the lowest total daily energy expenditure, and you can see that it's spread across a body fat percent of about 25% up to over 40%. If you look at the graph above, it's these women, the ones who are at the bottom of the scale. So obesity is not simply a matter of low total daily energy expenditure. And this model also can demonstrate why it is that someone can increase their caloric intake by about 150 calories a day and not continue to gain weight for the rest of their lives. 
they'll reach a plateau where the increase in mass is using the increased energy. And they'll level off between energy intake and expenditure. If they gain, if they consume more calories, they'll gain more weight and level off. If they reduce their calories by 150 calories a day, they'll go back down until they reach that balance again. One of the most interesting things about energy balance to me is this matching that we seem to see between intake and expenditure and the mechanisms for doing that. And that's that's uh, represented in this diagram on the left where you have quintiles of total daily energy expenditure where you have the least amount and the most amount. And as you can see, relative to daily energy intake in kcals per day, you have this nice relationship. And this will explain why it is that over time, over short periods of time, people can eat much more than they burn or vice versa and not change their weight dramatically over short periods of time. Go downstairs when there's free food and look at the students. You know, <laughs> what you're going to see are, are students consuming huge amounts of calories. They aren't burning that many calories every day, but they're not going to gain weight within a day. It takes a mismatch over time. There's a rate involved, so it takes time for people to gain or lose weight. If you look at the diagram on the right, which is, this is showing quintiles of the body weight change in the energy balance group. <coughs> so we weighed them when they came in for baseline and we asked them, what did you weigh two months ago? What did you weigh a year ago? And this is the difference between their reported weight a year ago and what we measured. And you can see that the quintiles on either end were dramatic reductions in weight or dramatic increases in weight. What's causing that? The diagram I'm showing on the left is the body weight change quintiles that I just showed you in the other graph. Arrows somewhere. So here are the people who lost the weight. Here are the people who gained the most weight. And on the y-axis is, is the energy per kilogram of body weight. So the blue dots are total daily energy expenditure, total daily energy intake, energy expenditure, at an intensity of less than three mets, and then in the green, an energy expenditure of greater than three mets. A couple of things jump out. First of all, is this matching across quintiles? And if you take the data and graph it out between the relative total daily energy expenditure, which is per kilogram, and the relative total daily energy intake, you can see this correlation, pink are the women, blue are men and the overall correlation is about 0.49. Another thing you notice is that the low intensity and sedentary activity isn't much different across groups, but the decrease in total daily energy expenditure can be explained two ways. First, by this decrease that you see in the energy expenditure at three mets or above, and also this diagram on the right, which is showing the relative resting metabolic rate, which is mils per kilogram, versus the change in body weight quintiles. And you can see that there's this dramatic drop from the people who've lost the most weight to the individuals who gained the most weight across the quintiles. So I can explain this difference in total daily energy expenditure across the groups by the change in what I call physical activity energy expenditure and this difference in resting metabolic rate. 60% of the calories burned for individuals is mostly through resting metabolic rate. So these individuals over on the right are doomed. Well, not really doomed. But somehow they need to try and raise that resting metabolic rate. It's going to be hard to offset that by doing physical activity for an hour a day. You can't show a, a, a slide, you can't show a, a presentation at this meeting without having something with physical activity in the title. So I put this in, physical activity and body fat percent, which I have not talked about before. And uh, one of the questions was, what is it that, you, that can be used to predict body fat percent? And I've always thought that physical activity would be a good way to do that. So if you look at the quintiles of percent body fat, 15.8 being the lowest group, 47% being the highest group, the y-axis is physical activity energy expenditure per kilogram, so that's three mets or more and you can see this relationship. If you break that down farther, and the diagram over on the right is just, uh, is just a teaser for a poster that's gonna be shown by Amanda after this session, I took the women and the men and separated them out for daily energy expenditure per kilogram of body weight 
into below three mets, three to six mets, and above six mets. And what really stands out to me, first of all, is this significant <coughs> gap. Oh, and this is body fat percent, so 30, 40, 50 percent. When you get above 40 percent, look at the significant gap here between the low, moderate, and, and vigorous. There's almost no activity going on in this group at anything above sedentary or very low activity. The other thing that stuck out in my mind was the fact that if you look at the men across their body fat percent range, there's almost no difference in energy expenditure at a low level. So what do we get from this? First of all, body weight's regulated over time by a partial matching between intake and expenditure. Total daily energy expenditure and absolute resting metabolic rate are dependent on mass and can predict weight. Change in body weight was dependent on the relative daily energy expenditure and the relative daily energy intake, so per kilogram rather than total organism weight. The resting total daily energy expenditure is determined by the resting metabolic rate per kilogram and by the amount of movement that's taking place by these individuals. And you can use the physical activity energy expenditure to predict body fatness. And lastly, something that I thought was surprising was that gender differences exist in the relationship of body fatness and the degree of energy flux. And I use flux instead of intensity simply because in my mind intensity is related to some maximal capacity, whereas flux is really talking about the amount of energy that's being used over a period of time. So my take home message from this is how you burn calories, as well as how many calories you burn, plays a significant role in obesity. And let me finish by showing, showing the same slide that Steve did. Uh, it, it's an amazing group and it's a wonderful group to work with. Everybody's very professional. And Steve was trying to point out Robin Schuch, who was here, and Amanda Palooch, who was here, and they will be presenting posters after this meeting. So I'm giving them a little, uh, I hope you will go by and, and talk to them. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any burning issues? Point of clarification? All very clear? We've got one at the back, John. Uh, resting metabolic rate against body weight. Uh, years ago, we thought that the relationship between <coughs> resting, metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate and uh, body weight was due to uh, a higher lean body mass. But, uh, am I getting from you that it's just total weight or even changing fat content? Uh, changes your resting metabolic rate. Can I just clarify that everyone could hear that question? Because, of, could you hear over there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Dogma is that resting metabolic rate, relative resting metabolic rate is related to lean mass. Yeah. We're not finding that. We're actually finding there's a better relationship between fat mass and resting metabolic rate. So you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you. We want, we want start the general questions now, but thank you for clarifying that. We'll move straight to our next speaker. Um, Professor Robert Ross is a Canadian, very well-known Canadian exercise physiologist. You'll notice a trend here. These three speakers are all from one side of the energy balance equation, in my view. And the next one also belongs on the energy expenditure side because he's an exercise physiologist and a professor from Queen's University in Canada. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Wendy, and thank you to uh, all the organizers and sponsors for uh, allowing me to come and share a few uh, minutes with you. I'm going to change gears uh, just a, a, a little bit, and you'll see why a few minutes into the uh, short time that I have to spend with you. But the question I'm basically asking uh, with respect to uh, energy balance is um, perhaps uh, uh, stated better this way. If you expend a given uh, volume uh, of energy uh, during exercise, does intensity matter? Does it matter how you expend that uh, energy? So that, that's essentially what I'm going to uh, try and consider over the next uh, few minutes. And in, in fact, if you look at the guidelines and, and consider them, and I put AHA here, WHO UK, uh, the Australian guidelines essentially the same, they imply that the answer to that question is no. 
If you do 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise or 75 uh, minutes per week, the implication is they're the same. You get no benefit if you do, uh, if you expend the 500 minutes quicker, you just, you just get the benefit of time. So there's no added benefit other than uh, the shorter time uh, that you use to expend uh, uh, the energy. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Ian Jensen, uh, pictured here, and I give Ian full credit, he did all that heavy lifting on this paper. I was essentially a freeloader. And basically what we did was uh, uh, take a look, cross-sectional data using the uh, 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 NHANES data set that we had access to. And because we uh, have uh, estimated uh, measures of moderate and vigorous physical activity using accelerometry data, we thought it might be a nice data set to, uh, to consider uh, this question of whether or not, in fact, uh, the guidelines, 150 minutes or 75 minutes, uh, is exactly the same. So here I have, of course, on, on the uh, access uh, energy expenditure in, in med minutes. You know that uh, very well. And we, uh, the outcome we chose was the metabolic uh, uh, syndrome. And here I, I, I show you here the first line. And this is real data, continuous analysis of the data that we saw. And it comes as no surprise to you that as, as you increase the uh, amount of energy that you expend, the prevalence of the metabolic syndrome uh, decreases. Now, if the guidelines uh, 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 suggested um, were indeed uh, uh, correct in this case, then the blue line for vigorous would fall right on top of that uh, red line. But uh, that's not what we what we found. In fact, uh, if you um, uh, uh, use vigorous activity for 75 minutes, you've got a very profound uh, reduction in metabolic syndrome. That, that's not a a trivial uh, uh, difference uh, uh, there, and it was actually uh, uh, quite a surprise uh, uh, to us to uh, to make uh, the findings. So it, it's cross-sectional data, and it, uh, it has to be taken for the limitations. I should also say that we, we use intensity here uh, loosely because, of course, these are uh, met minutes, and it's not a relative intensity. It's just whether you do vigorous or modern intensity exercise. Now, given the uh, nature and the theme here, I thought I'd show you one other observation from this study, and that's just to simply say that we, uh, if we look at the uh, 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 groups that did vigorous physical activity as shown to you here, no, low, and high, uh, after control for the moderate uh, um, dose of exercise, waist circumference did in fact differ across the uh, uh, vigorous activity groups. As you can see here, I don't show you, but the 94 is significantly uh, less than the 98. When we did the appropriate statistics, uh, indeed, um, when you control for waist circumference, some of the benefit of, vis uh, of vigorous physical activity was attenuated, uh, but for some outcomes it was, uh, it was not. So, so certainly in this case, abdominal obesity or lowering of the waistline seems to be a mechanism uh, by which vigorous activity uh, for a given amount of exercise uh, might confer a benefit. Um, in the world uh, that I live in as a, as a trialist, this is the way I make my living, doing randomized controlled trials. And in this, for this particular question, not all questions, but for this one, uh, perhaps it's the type of evidence uh, uh, that you might look to to get an answer uh, to the question. So again, if we, if, if just to revisit the question that I'm looking at t today, if we consider that exercise dose is a product, of course, as you all know, of volume, intensity, and frequency. If I'm trying to isolate intensity the, and, and answer this question, then there's two things that I, I, I can do. I can choose to do a given amount of minutes, as, I, as I'm showing you here, and I can, I can um, alter the intensity as a, a relative intensity now, as either a percent of VO2 max or heart rate max, which, whichever you prefer. If I do that, I have the same uh, uh, amount of exercise in terms of minutes, but of course what's going to happen is the volume, the work I'm going to do in that time is going, is going to differ. And now I have two things changing, intensity and the volume. And to me, that's not an optimal uh, situation. I much prefer this one. I'm, I'm going to titrate the volume of exercise that I do. In this case, I'm making up these numbers, uh, 500. And I'm going to uh, differ in exercise intensity. And then I'm going uh, to have different minutes. But I think it's only in this design, and, and you may disagree with me, it's only in this design where we can properly tease out whether or not exercise intensity matters in terms of uh, um, a number of health outcomes. But we also have to do a few other things uh, in these trials. And one, we, we have to assume, or we have to make sure that the diet quality 
and quantity is maintained for the duration of the intervention. I say from the podium whenever I can, if you think you can just exercise and eat whatever you want and get the benefits of lifestyle, you're sadly mistaken, and the reverse is also true. So we have to make sure there's no outcome we're going to look at which diet quality isn't going to consider. But if we do that and we don't increase or decrease that, then the negative energy balance is, of course, induced uh, by exercise. And these uh, types of studies are not for the tame. They're very, very difficult to do. So the evidence uh, I'll look at in, in, in two ways. One, the, the first one, small sample size, short duration. Uh, uh, I don't have much time to go through the, 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 the ways in which these studies are done, but uh, they, in fact, did control the volume of exercise done in the two groups, or they did the best they could, supervised exercise. They made sure that the participants uh, did not alter their diet, at least the best they could, in a free living situation. And basically, this is uh, what, they, what they find. And they found here that, in fact, uh, the only statistically different uh, observation in terms of weight and waste uh, between uh, these uh, two groups here was a, a waist circumference, and I, I will give you that that might be statistically significant, but the, the effect is, is not much different. Clinically, I don't think that's different at all. And, and in fact, if you look at some of the clinical outcomes, in this case, uh, some of the metabolic syndrome uh, variables, in fact, the uh, interval uh, group improved more than uh, the moderate. So a bit of a mixed bag, but again, very, very small, short duration, very a small uh, sample size. Rich Coker's group uh, stateside, very similar uh, trial, and again, I'm pointing out here, very, very small uh, uh, sample size, very short uh, duration, but in fact, they did match the energy expenditure, and that's what we would want to see. They did try and control dietary intake. And they uh, make a very different finding in terms of abdominal visceral fat, which uh, many of you would consider a primary target. In fact, they saw that the high intensity exercise here was associated with a reduction. I can, I can accept that. I can understand the uh, um, uh, endocrine environment that uh, is a consequence of high intensity exercise.